This video is a general introduction into the properties of the transition metals as required by AQA A-level chemistry. Then for each one of those properties, there's a further video that gives you more detail. Now at GCSE, you probably regarded the whole of that central block between group two and group three as being transition metals. But at A-level, we're going to start refining that definition a little bit because it helps us to explain some of the characteristic properties of this group of elements. So now if you're taking AQA A-level chemistry, we're going to say that the transition metals are all of the elements that have an incomplete D subshell in either their atoms or their ions, or usually both. So just to emphasize this, here's our periodic table. So between group two and group three, or group 13, if you prefer to label it that way, we have what's known as the D block. And all of the elements in the D block have their outermost highest energy electron in one of the D orbitals in the D subshell. And the D subshell has room for 10 electrons. So as we go across the period, um, scandium has one electron in the, the 3D subshell, titanium has two, vanadium has three, chromium, of course, has five, just to be a little bit odd. And then we carry on five in manganese, six in iron, seven in cobalt, eight in nickel. So the first eight elements in every period have an incomplete D subshell in their atom. OK, there's still room in the D subshell for more electrons. And then when we get to copper, the same thing happens as happened earlier. And instead of having nine electrons in its 3D subshell, copper actually has 10 and it only has one electron in the 4S subshell instead. So if we just looked at the atoms, well, then copper wouldn't be a transition metal according to our definition. But when we look at the ions, when copper forms ions, its most stable ion is a two plus ion. And to make that two plus ion, we lose that 4s electron, and then also you lose a further electron from the 3d subshell. And so um, the stable ion of copper has an incomplete d subshell. And so therefore, copper is a transition metal. But when we look at zinc and the rest of that group, um, even when they start forming ions, they lose the electrons in their um, 4s subshell or their whichever um, number it is, S subshell, but they don't lose the electrons from the D subshell. And therefore, this last bit of that D block, they are not transition metals. And when we start to look at the various properties of transition metals, we'll find out that things like zinc are actually very different from the rest of that group. So just to show it in a slightly different way, here are um, the final bits of the electron configuration for that fourth period of the D block. And as you can see, we've got incomplete D subshells all the way across until we get as far as nickel um, and then copper and zinc both have a full uh, 3d subshell and then when we start looking um, at the ions again um, we've obviously got um, these ones along here have all got incomplete d subshells um, scandium doesn't scandium actually completely empties out its d subshell as well um, but we do usually still regard it as a transition metal because in the atomic form it has an incomplete d subshell and then when we get to um, copper and zinc making ions, when copper makes ions, now it does have an incomplete D subshell. Um, but in zinc, the D subshell is still full. So zinc is not a transition metal. Having an incomplete D subshell is directly responsible for these four properties that we expect transition metals to have. And there's a little bit more detail about each of these in the next four videos. So we expect transition metals to form colored ions, have variable oxidation states, form complexes, or they're sometimes called complex ions, and have catalytic activity. If you study GCSE chemistry, the triple science, um, then you're already familiar with the idea that um, different transition metal ions have certain characteristic colours, and you can use the sodium hydroxide precipitation test to identify those. So if you add sodium hydroxide and you see a sort of orangey brown rusty precipitate, then that indicates the presence of iron three plus ions. Whereas if you get a dark green precipitate, then that's iron two plus ions. And if you get a blue precipitate, then that's copper two plus ions. And at A-level, we're going to meet um, some more colours, some more examples of that. So, for instance, um, vanadium really commonly has oxidation states of five, four, three and two. And those will turn um, yellow and then blue and then green and then violet. And we also talk in a little bit more detail about why it is that the transition metals produce these coloured compounds. So if you're anything like most of the people I teach, then when you learnt that everything in group one makes ions with a single positive charge and that everything in group two makes cations with a two plus charge and elements in group three, like aluminium, make ions with a three plus charge, probably the first thing you asked was, well, what about the D block? What kind of ions do they make? And hopefully by now you've cottoned on to the fact 
um, that most of the elements in that D block, most of the transition metals can make um, monatomic ions with multiple charges and also um, can sometimes make compound ions, say with oxygen, where the metal has a different oxidation state again. Um, so here are some examples of um, oxidation states that these metals can take, and the ones in bold are the particularly common ones. Um, so for instance, we've just mentioned that vanadium can produce ions in which it has an oxidation state of two or three or four or five, and three and five are the particularly common ones. And then likewise, chromium can do everything from plus two up to plus six. Um, but the particularly common ones are plus two, plus three, plus six, you know, the Aaron Brockovich favourite, hexavalent chromium, and so on and so forth. Um, and you don't really need to memorise loads of these, um, but there are sort of particular examples that you need to know about. It's also important that you can use the oxidation state of that metal, which will be indicated using Roman numerals, in order to derive the formula of an ionic compound. So for instance, if we think about oxides of vanadium, then if we've got um, vanadium with a plus two oxidation state, then that will form vanadium monoxide, which is VO. And if the vanadium has an oxidation state of plus three, then we get vanadium sesquioxide, which is V2O3. And if the vanadium has an oxidation state of plus four, then it will make vanadium dioxide, which is VO2. And finally, if the vanadium has an oxidation state of plus five, we get vanadium pentoxide, so V2O5. One of the most interesting things that transition metals are able to do is to form complexes, like iron at the centre of haemoglobin. So a complex is basically where you have a transition metal atom or iron, and because it's a transition metal, it has an incomplete D subshell. And because that D subshell is incomplete, it's able to accept lone pairs of electrons from what we call ligands. So a ligand could be either an atom or a molecule or an anion that has a lone pair of electrons that it is able to donate. And so this obviously forms essentially a dative covalent bond or a coordinate bond. And you can see in this diagram here that I've drawn those as arrows because that's how we distinguish between a dative covalent bond and just like a regular vanilla covalent bond. So multiple ligands are going to donate lone pairs of electrons to this central metal atom or ion to form this complex. And you can see here that we've got square brackets around the entire complex ion to demonstrate that this, um, this overall charge applies to the whole ion rather than one specific part. Um, and you're also going to need to be able to discuss what's called the coordination number, which is basically how many bonds are there to this central atom or central ion. So here I've drawn a hexa aqua copper two plus ion, um, and you can see that there are six water molecules, each donating a lone pair of electrons. Um, and so because there are those six ligands, each forming a single bond, um, we would say that this ion has a coordination number of six. The final property that you need to be aware of for the transition metals is that they make really excellent catalysts. Um, so that's chemicals that can speed up the rate of a reaction without being used up or changed themselves. And again, this links back to their atomic structure and to all the other properties. So because they're able to move between these different stable oxidation states, in a lot of cases, this means that they're basically able to make quite weak temporary bonds um, to allow reactants to react and then um, to return quite quickly to their original state. And you've already met throughout GCSE and A-level a number of instances where this is the case. So, for instance, um, the use of iron as the catalyst in the harbour process to make ammonia, the use of nickel when you're turning unsaturated fats into saturated fats by hydrogenating them, um, the use of platinum and other platinum group metals like palladium and rhodium in catalytic converters, um, reducing the amount of carbon monoxide and NOx um, that's coming out of car exhausts. Um, you've probably used manganese dioxide um, in the decomposition of um, hydrogen peroxide. Um, there's also the use of vanadium and vanadium oxides in the contact process, which is used to make sulfuric acid and also cobalt. I hope that that was a useful introduction to the topic. There are individual videos for each of those properties that go into much more detail, so make sure that you are watching those as well. Um, I hope it was useful, so thank you for watching and don't forget to subscribe.